to start right now. Yeah, I mean, we're recording. Oh, are we? <laughs> okay, hi. My name is Chris Kemp. My name's Sam Kemp. And we are... <laughs> the Rock Salt. Awesome. Oh, well, we're still doing that? <laughs> yeah, okay. might as well. And we, we are, are awesome. awesome. Air high five. Air high Woo. five. Okay, awesome. That's great. Well, it's always exciting when Sam and I get together, especially for me. First off, I really love getting together with Sam. And <laughs> second off, I second thing is I it's fun to talk. It's fun to have a good conversation. Yeah, conversation is, is important. I mean, yes. that's that's one of the things I love about doing podcasts like this is you know, you don't there's not very much like there's not very many people that get to sit down for like an hour or two and just have a straight up conversation without anybody bugging them or anything distracting them and yeah and uh, I think even if you don't post the podcast it's just good to have to to like increase your skills with conversation and right you know stuff like that yeah I noticed a couple of things when I'm listening to uh, the podcast that we've already recorded and that is the way my brain works yeah. I start a sentence and then I'll I change it in the middle. So I'll go halfway with the sentence and then another thought comes into my head that's more complete. And so I'll jump to that instead. So my goal is to I'll do that with texting. Yeah. And so my goal is to complete a full sentence without yeah. stopping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, one of my goals too is to be able to speak better while I'm on the spot because even though like nobody's watching this at this moment, they're gonna hear it in the future. Yeah. And you that's that's on your head when you're talking. <laughs> yeah. And so and yeah, then you think good. about it sometimes when you're talking about something and then you start like, you know, having a harder time finishing what you're saying. Yes. Oh, I understand <laughs> that totally. Yeah. And I've noticed that too. I mean, I'm not even that old, but I have noticed that uh, it is a little bit more difficult for me to find certain words. And, and that really has to do with what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Um, it's, it's called the gut brain connection. And, and, um, and we're not going to specifically go into that today, but that's part of ailments and disease. So we were, I, that's what we've chosen to talk about today. And, yeah. and if really what they say, what the experts say, and I've listened to a lot of different medical doctors, naturopaths, and nutritionists that have all learned and researched that you have a second brain, and it is called your stomach. So, and then some people... Is it people, the stomach or is it the gut? Well, it's, it's the... I guess the gut uh, is right. part of the stomach, it though, is, right? Well, the, the gut... The, the gut's the tube that starts from your neck and goes all the way down to the anus, right? That, it's that's actually, the entire yeah, gut, but it's it? even farther than that. Not well, not past your anus, but it starts in your mouth. In your mouth? Yeah. Okay. So it starts in your mouth, and it goes through your mouth, down your esophagus, and then it goes into your stomach, and then you go into your small intestine, which consists of three different parts, the duodenum, the GI jumen, Oh, sorry, I didn't say that right. Jejunum and the ileum. And those are I three no sections. Idea. Yeah. People don't know about this. When I started learning about it, I went, what? I've never heard of it. Three jejunum. sections of the intestines. Yeah, so they three, all do different things? They all, they do. They all do different things. They break out, they break down different foods and absorb different nutrients. And so that is why it's so important to, that's the section of our, see there, I just interrupted that thought. That's the section of the digestive system that does most of the absorbing. It isn't the only place, but it is the main place. And then also, then we go into the large intestine and then finally the colon and then the, the rectum and then the anus. Mm. So those are the parts of our uh, digestive system. And the goal is to eat whole food, to uh, eat a very nutrient-dense diet, and have the small intestine absorb the minerals and nutrients that are in in those foods to the, you know. Mm. I guess I didn't know. Now that I think of it, there is a difference. There's a small intestine and a large intestine. I remember that. But I guess yeah. I didn't realize there were three parts. 
Yeah, that's what I think. I didn't realize that either when I started studying it. And I and so it's been really awesome to learn about that and just how it's all broken down. And our bodies are incredible. Our bodies are yeah. amazing uh, machines or whatever you want to call them. Creations are just really amazing. Yeah, going to the gut, you know, and how it's, you know, you say the gut you're saying that we have two different brains and I'm guessing you mean by the guts kind of one of our brains or you yes. say you say the stomach but you probably referring to the whole gut too in general right like because yes but I I would say largely the stomach largely the stomach mm-hmm. well isn't the se- isn't the reason why it's the second brain is because it's tons of bacteria that's making decisions on its own yes exactly and a lot of that bacteria that makes the decisions are in your stomach yep and in your entire digestive tract so all so of all three, just, all three mm-hmm. intestine systems. Yep, and parts. your colon even. There's just is bacteria. Col- is the in colon there. part of the intestine? Yes. Is that the third part? The colon is toward the end, and so um, there's some really great videos you can watch to see how that works. And I think <laughs> it sounds funny. I I can't tell you other than Doctor Oz and just look up poop. Yeah. You know, look up to poop, and, and yeah. you'll find a really great video on what your poop's supposed to look like. Yeah, that reminds me. If we're going to talk about poop for a second, um, I've heard your gut's so powerful at influencing, like, your health and stuff that people, some people, or, like, some doctors will give people healthy poo in a capsule that they eat to help help them, like, uh get get healthy again like and they usually it's usually for people that like take antibiotics and they're and they kill all the bacteria and so you're you're really weak and you get sick easy and if that if that's happening all the time you probably have a weak you have a weak gut or you have you have bad bacteria or or dead bacteria in your gut and or not enough yeah and so sometimes i've heard doctors do that they they have somebody eat somebody's poop (laughs) in a capsule and it makes them healthy it's it's Maybe I don't know. Well, no, there's a better way that. to do that. It depends. I'm sure I know there's a better way, but maybe that's like. Well, here. There's a lot of better ways to do things, but <laughs> people don't want to eat healthy, and and so those are how some things have to be done sometimes, you know. Well, here's there are a couple of ways of doing that. I think it depends on which part of the gut you're trying to rehabitat or whatever re, uh, re-inhabit re or yeah. whatever with bacteria. Um, so. There are fuel or fuel. There are um, stool injections that you can get rectally, so you can actually have uh, someone else's healthy bacteria, st- you know, stool, uh, be yeah. injected into your rectum, and it will go. That bacteria will travel up into your intestines. Uh, if you take it orally, of course, you're going to try and re-inhabit. And I, what's the word I'm looking for? In, uh, uh, habitat or ha- inhabit the the stomach. Yeah. So, um, and the re- the, the thing that you're looking for is so what? How do you know if you need that? Well, first off, the best way to know is well, there's a few ways of knowing. The first one would probably be that you have gut problems. Yeah. Okay. So you're not feeling very good. You don't poop too often or you have diarrhea all the time or it's back and forth back and forth that isn't what you want you really want to have uh if you're eating three meals a day you want to have three bowel movements a day Mm. okay um once every other day is not enough once a week is definitely not enough you are considered a week that sounds rough yeah very rough but some people are very used to that and they need to get um they need to see a doctor. They need to get their bodies regulated. And some people will say, well, that's just hereditary. My mom was like that. Or, or I've been like that my whole life. And and um, whether you have or you have not, that is not good for your body. Yeah, how have you been eating your whole life? Right. That's a good question right there. Yeah, and, and that means there's something going on because uh, you want to get that stuff out of you. You want to get that old, the waste matter eliminated out of your body as quickly as possible in a healthy way so that it doesn't stay in there and cause disease because it can cause disease. It can mm. cause a lot of problems in your body. And even just low stomach acid, low hydrochloric acid, that's what our stomach acid is called. Even that can cause so many 
many disorders. You wouldn't even believe the number of disorders that just low stomach acid causes. Yet people think that they have too much stomach acid and they start taking antacids. It's very rare that you find someone that has too much stomach acid. Mm. Everybody that has indigestion has low stomach acid. So to remedy that is you would take a, a one to three teaspoons of ap- Bragg's apple cider vinegar. And I say that because it has the mother in it, it has good, right, the right pH. Well, balance. maybe this is a stupid question, but what is indig- indigestion? Like, is that just having a hard time processing your food? It is. But what happens is that because you don't have enough stomach acid, your your food begins to, your, your stomach is like a... Um, I mean, it is just churning, churning, trash churning. Can? Yeah, it I'm just, just churns. It's kind of like that. It's like a trash <laughs> compactor, know. you know. <laughs> yeah. That's a good example. But it's just, it's a like disposal. But, but with jet engines, and you don't feel that. I it, mean, I was making fun of it when I said trash can. <laughs> I, I think we had a health coaching session once where you were telling me that people just treat their stomach like a trash can, and they just. I don't know. I yeah, don't know it is kind. Of, well, some people in a like negative, that. I was like, food. I was saying it in a negative way. <laughs> well, our stomachs are like the furnace. Yeah, that, yeah, it makes sense. You're feeding. you you know, in the old days, you would put charcoal. Analogy. You would put coal in the furnace. It would burn it for fuel. Yeah. And, and that's really similar to what's going on in your stomach. But your stomach is churning. It's turning all the time, and it breaks down that food. But it doesn't start there. It starts in our mouths. So, um, so anyway, yeah. So the first bite of food that you take, it, you know, you mix in the saliva. Most people don't chew their food enough. You want to, the way, let's see, who was it that said this? You want to drink your food and chew your drinks. And it's wh- so hard to do. Yeah. It really is. Like when we were doing our health coaching sessions together and you were, telling me he's like you need to eat slower and chew your food for longer and i was like that's i'm trying and it's not easy like i'll chew i'll eat my eggs and i'll swallow i'll take like three chews with those eggs and swallow them and and you're telling me i need to chew like chew them down to a liquid that like it kind of grosses me out when i do it like when i chew things down longer than normal and it just mm-hmm. starts becoming mush in my mouth, and I just keep chewing on it like like a cow. It feels like you know, like well, what? There's and I know that's what I'm supposed do to do. It. Well, it makes sense. Do you I'm, know why? Well, maybe I'm wrong, but I figure that the saliva in your mouth helps break down the food better, and and it helps process it better when it gets to your stomach. So when you so when you chew your food for a while and break it down, and it gets the saliva mixed in there, then you swallow it. It like instead of having food that only has your saliva mixed in a little bit and then when it gets to your stomach your stomach doesn't process it as well and then maybe you waste more food when you chew up your food and the saliva gets all over you know every crevice of your food that you chewed up when it gets to your stomach the saliva helps break it down and you utilize your food food better is that is that correct yeah well what or is yeah, it different than that? Be, no you're right on track what it is is that so when you when you swallow food in whole pieces you don't chew it enough then you don't have as much surface area for the enzymes to cover. So it doesn't get broken down. Are the enzymes well. in your saliva? Yes. And the enzymes start in your saliva. And there's a different enzyme for your macronutrients. So uh, you have different enzymes that break down the different foods. But, for instance, um, so when you chew your food, it becomes more of a liquid. And what happens to the surface area? It gets bigger. Because you've chewed that food up. And Wait, it, the surface area? The surface area of your food. When you chew it and you chew it into liquid, pretty much, the surface area is bigger. Hmm. And then it you and that allows more enzymes to break down the food easier and it allows for easier digestion. Yeah. And uh, so you're going to actually and more nutrients will be absorbed in the small intestine. And I haven't really thought about this till now either, but if you do that and then it gets down to your stomach and it digests easier, you probably utilize your energy better because you you don't have, your stomach doesn't have to put in as much work and then you have more energy mm-hmm. to utilize in other ways. Yeah, and I'm all yeah. I'm all about uh, conserving my energy and utilizing it to the fullest because I think we have a lot of energy that gets wasted 
in in different ways like with your emotions your emotions take a lot of your energy and now i'm realizing that your stomach takes probably way more energy than it should because we don't chew our food good enough yeah and i think being aware of that's important i think it's really important to know that and it can cause a lot of digestive disorders and um and so is that s- s- where stomach aches come from to a there degree? are different reasons different reasons yeah. and everyone is individual when it comes to what's going on in their gut because they have different bacteria and so you they've taken identical twins and one can eat sugar and one can't and and that really is what's going on in their gut and they can be very different maybe this is going a little out there a little bit but i've heard that the people you surround yourself with changes your gut biome too like like the bacteria in your gut like just just being around people you guys share you guys share we share bacteria and being around a healthy person shares you know you sh- you guys share bacteria with each other so you're sharing that healthier person's healthy bacteria whatever you call health i guess and so the people you surround yourself with can have a, an effect on your gut too. I don't remember where I heard that. I heard that on some podcast. That might be a little far out there. Well, I think that if you're married to someone, if you're having intimate relations with somebody, you're going to experience that more. Yeah. Because you're sharing sense. body fluids. Yeah. So you're, you know, whatever. And, 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 but as far as a roommate that you're living with, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> you not. Know. Or a family member. Uh, maybe if you complex. drink from the same cup, you're going to get maybe some bacteria off of the cup. But yeah. the, the awesome thing about our bodies is this. And that is that hydrochloric acid that's in your gut, you want to have the right amount. Because it is the, it is a barrier. It is a protection and the to hyd- our, whole, our whole bodies because it... Uh, because we all have some terrible bacteria that we eat. And what is hydrochloric acid? It's the it's, it's what breaks down our food. It's the stuff in your stomach. And it and it has a pH of about one point two to is that, two. Is that the bile? No, it's not the bile. But the bile is another thing and that's a so, different topic. <laughs> but that's in your stomach too, right? Or is that in your that liver? That is in your liver and your gallbladder. Okay. And your pancreas. All right. What's the different mm-hmm. subject? So, yeah, and so, but it, but still, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, they're all part of the digestive system to a certain degree because they break down, they help break down fat. Yeah. But the fat begins to break down in your stomach. Uh, mm. So, anyway, but that's, um, I just want you to pay attention to, Sam, too, when you eat, if you ever eat a piece of bread or any kind of pasta or anything that's floury, yeah, if you hold it in your mouth long enough, it'll begin to taste sweet. And the reason why is because those enzymes mm. in your saliva are breaking it down. And that is how quickly simple carbs are broken down. Yeah. They go that they fast are, on. They're breaking down in your mouth. Yeah. And they, there are only um, three things that are absorbed through the stomach. And one of them is water, alcohol, and sugar. Those are the only things that are absorbed in the stomach? And the fat is absorbed after the stomach? The, the fat is broken down in the stomach, but is not absorbed through the stomach walls into the bloodstream. Mm. So these are some things. So is that, is that why um, fat is like a slower acting fuel yeah, source? Is it because is. It, it has to go through more processes? It, it, yeah, since fat, so it and, takes and longer. And sugar breaks down in your mouth yeah does it absorb through your mouth too it can if you leave it in there long enough hmm. yeah. and i also know that's not good because that's why we get cavities right because well, yeah if you don't rinse your mouth out or brush your teeth and yeah i mean the ph isn't that what it is the ph balance changes in your mouth and your mouth becomes mm-hmm. acidic mm-hmm. and the ass when and that's from Simp- that's from glucose, right? The glucose yeah. can make your mouth acidic, and that's what causes cavities. Is the acidic when yeah, your mouth yeah. becomes acidic? Yes, yeah, it begins to break things down, and and um, and it's really interesting to me that you know I've I've often wondered, well, how does the hydrochloric acid just stay in your stomach? Doesn't it go down into your small intestine? How? I mean, we think that when we're 
have heartburn, that's really just undigested food. Yeah. That has been mixed in with some enzymes and some chlor- hydrochloric acid that comes up into our esophagus and it burns. But in reality, the prob- the reason it's coming back up is because you don't have enough hydrochloric acid to get it to go down mm. and to break down enough. I see. So then, uh, what, a half an hour th- to two hours or more later, you start getting heartburn. It isn't happening exactly right after when you eat. And, it's the hydro- later. and we get more hydrochloric acid from having a healthy gut. Yes. Or healthy and stomach. The main gut. cause of uh, hydrochloric acid reduction in the gut is stress. Mm. That's stress big. and i i can't i don't know enough n- right now to tell you the mechanics of why that happens but um but that is the main cause of reduction in hydrochloric acid and how many people do you know that have heartburn uh i'm sure there's a lot but yeah. i don't talk to people about that enough well, i've i've or not, i don't pay well, attention enough really it happens a lot to older people but yeah. it's it's people are getting younger and younger. They're younger and not getting younger and younger, but the incidence of heartburn in people is at younger ages now. Yeah. So um, there are problems. I just had a friend tell me about her grandson that he was he's 14 years old and he was just diagnosed with colitis and Crohn's disease. That doesn't sound good. No, it's a, those are digestive problems. They're down in the uh, colon and in the large intestine. It's it's really rough for him. And another connection is IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. And they're noticing that a lot of people that have anxiety and depression and mental or mood disorders, let's put it that way, um, they have colon issues. They have uh, IBS or colitis or... Crohn's yeah. disease and and there's a link there and the link is simply because there's inflammation in the gut there's inflammation going on and that triggers inflammation in the brain but you also need to remember that about 70 percent of all serotonin is produced in the gut what does serotonin do serotonin is a neurotransmitter and and for a oh, lot it's of in people your brain. yeah well it's in your gut it's in your gut, but it gets moved to your brain? Mm, it's in your gut, and that's where we have that gut-brain connection. It signals. Mm. So it signals the brain. And we always think because it makes us feel good or it gives us feelings of, of peace, it gives us feelings of um, tranquility, and uh, that we think it's in the brain. But yeah, it but it, so it's not created there, but it sends a signal there that makes yeah. us feel that. Yeah. Well, I did yeah. not know that. Yeah, it's but interesting. But where, where is it created in the gut? Like, there's the guts all the way from your mouth to your anus. What part? Or is it, do you know? Um, well, I'm not exactly sure what part of the gut it is. I'm still learning about that. See, so I'm sharing it, with you what I've learned so far because yeah. I'm in a nutrition course, and it's really awesome what I've learned, and that's, I love it. Yeah, I had no idea. That's crazy. Yeah, and so actually their neuropinephrine is another one that's produced largely in the gut. Yeah. And um, also adrenaline is another one that's produced in the gut. So if you have something uh, coming up, like you're preparing for a test and you're about ready to take a test, sometimes we get um, butterflies in the stomach. So we know that it's that's a gut brain connection happening oh, right there. I never really thought about that. Yeah, your your stomach feels uneasy when you get nervous. Yeah, yeah. Really, when you're really nervous. Yeah, and we think, oh, it's my brain causing my gut to feel that way, but it it but it's it, the opposite. It's the opposite. Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. So what you put in your gut and how you treat your gut affects your brain, mm. big time, and. In a big way. And so you have these brain disorders such as autism and Alzheimer's. These are the big ones. Yeah. The big ones that we don't really connect to anything else. But they're finding that you can you can lessen a lot of those symptoms just by treating the gut and altering diet. And, but it needs to be altered in a very big way. And the three most offensive foods are sugar, gluten, and dairy. And how many of us can give those up completely? 
Um, yeah, I do wonder long. about Derry. Derry seems to be on the fence. Like it seems, it seems like there's not, from what I've learned, there's not a lot of science that shows that it's bad for everybody. But for some people, it does affect them negatively. But I also wonder if those people that it affects negatively, if their diets are bad. And because their diets are bad, it makes them so they can't handle dairy well. So I feel like dairy for me is, it's on the line. I don't know. I'm not well, for it or against it. It's just, it's it's from everything I listen to, it's up in the air right now. Well, dairy is a controversial thing. And, and part of that has to do with the fact that there really is only one part of the world that can handle dairy well. Yeah. And those that's Northern Europe. So that's been, that's been proven. So other people... Uh, there, some of the symptoms of being dairy sensitive would be a lot of mucus buildup. So anytime yeah. you eat drink milk or eat cheese or yogurt or cottage cheese or, or anything really, um, you start coughing and clearing your throat. Yeah, I'm drinking um, heavy whipping cream with my coffee right now, and I have a mucus buildup. So. Yeah, so that's a that's a dairy sensitivity right there having that happen. Now there mm. are some people that doesn't happen to them and they don't get gut have gut issues. But there is yeah. a there is a chemical that is produced that affects the brain that dairy produces and it's called arachidonic acid. Mm. And arachidonic like acid. A dinosaur. Yeah. It sounds like arachnophobia to me. <laughs> 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 but that's how I remember it. But anyway, so arachidonic acid has uh, can cause a lot of inflammation in the brain. And mm. that's something you really don't feel a lot of brain inflammation. Um, sometimes people will have headaches. And inflammation just means swelling, right? Yeah, it's swelling. So there's, it causes swelling in the brain. Yeah. And what, what's the effects of that? The effects of that over, if you're just getting it once in a while, it probably isn't going to be a big deal. But if yeah. you have long-standing inflammation in the gut, you have inflammation in the brain. I see. And how do you tell if you have inflammation in the gut again? Or you, you may have, have digestive it? issues if you have low hydrochloric acid. So uh, so if you get heartburn, because that, that relates to heartburn, right? Yeah, heartburn. And, and if you get heartburn a lot, you're more likely to get headaches. That's right. See. And and but not always. Not always. Everybody's a little bit different in how they yeah. how the symptoms a lot manifest of themselves. Yeah, there are a lot of factors. And so the foods that I named gluten, sugar, and dairy, they're very, very they are culprits in causing inflammation. Mm. Especially gluten. Well actually all of them, but gluten is a big one because gluten has a tendency what it does is it um it causes perforations in the gut lining. And uh, what's a per- perforation mean? A hole. Little tiny holes in the gut lining. It doesn't have some people might have just a few little perforated spots, you know, in their gut lining. Yeah. But what that means is so food particles or per- food proteins are leaking directly into the bloodstream from the gut. That gut lining is very important to protect the rest of your body from the contents of the stomach yeah and when those food proteins start going into the into the the bloodstream then your body attacks itself and then guess what develops an allergy Mm. okay so the more there so it can wait so i was spacing out a hair uh, when you said all that but you're saying when there's holes in your stomach that can cause allergies? Yeah, because you have food particles passing through proteins, food proteins that are passing into the bloodstream. And you're, and then what happens is automatically you begin producing white blood cells that start attacking it. And then what happens is when you eat that food, you become very sensitive to it. Okay, so some people, when they eat dairy, gluten, and what was the third Sugar. one? Sugar. Sugar. Uh, it can create holes in your stomach, and those holes that are created in your stomach can cause allergies. Yeah, but when you say holes, it makes it sound like there's giant holes in your just stomach. Just like tiny perforations, like just, like maybe tiny little yeah, specks. Pin, maybe little pinholes or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, because that and, – and what gluten does too is it can cause you to not uh, absorb – the nutrients in your small intestine. Yeah. Your small intestine is lined with um, villi. 
So there's... It's like a lining around it, it that protects they're it. They're little finger-like things, things. They're kind of like little, I don't know, they kind of make me think of in the ocean, seaweed type things, anemone or yeah. whatever. You know, it, they, they're they little finger type um, things that line your small intestine. And yeah. they, they're free. They don't, they're not stuck together. They, they, they stand up. But when you eat a lot of gluten, it smashes them down mm. and they can become plugged up with gluten. And that makes sense because you can take white flour and add some water to it and make paste. Yeah. It's like a glue. Yeah. And that's exactly how it acts in your gut. Interesting. So, so when it goes, comes to allergies, you can get allergies, like what kind of allergies, like, like just allergic to like the pollen stuff, or is it like everything like allergic to dogs and. Yes. Well, you're not eating, obviously you're not eating the dander from your dog, but the dander, but you're. Yeah. Well, I mean. But your body becomes really sensitive. So when those holes, when those perforations form in your stomach and the things get out. And they cause allergies. Do you think people that are like allergic to dogs and stuff like that, it, it could be caused because of that? It, it's possible. It, there yeah. are a lot of reasons that maybe some allergies <clears throat> that we have that are external, like hay hay fever yeah. or or dogs, pet allergies, or, um, you know, there's a lot of different things well, that we get bombarded with externally. Yeah, well, that, that brings brings to a point like something i've learned recently i know this is a very controversial subject but like doing like keto or i i mostly heard it from the carnivore diet where you only eat like animal products and meat which which means that you're excluding glucose and you know and and what what's the thing that's in in bread that you're um one of those three things that you're gluten? saying gluten yeah i always forget that name when you're excluding glucose and gluten and people that have been doing these diets they've been like it's been curing their allergies like some people are allergic to dogs and allergic to things like their whole life and then they they start doing these diets and and they like aren't allergic to those things anymore like i'm not saying mm-hmm. it's, ha- it's happens to everybody that does it but it's happened to some people that they've been talking about it and it might not be exactly because of like that they're doing a specific diet like carnivore or keto, which is like high fat, high protein, super low carbs. It might be the fact that they're when you do those diets, you fast more, you're just not eating as much, and you're not eating carbohydrates. Yeah. And cutting those things out, they could be the cause of your allergies. And I know a lot of people will probably think that's crazy, but I think one thing you got to ask yourself is, have you ever actually cut out? like sugar like ever or like carbohydrates ever in your entire life like to to an actual like extreme degree and i'm not saying Mm -hmm. it's a good idea to do that but for some people it might be a good idea it's Mm -hmm. not it's not a good idea for everybody but for some people i think it definitely might be a good idea if if you have tons of allergies and you have heartburn and headaches all the time and you get sick all the time it's def i think it's definitely something that's worth trying out is like trying a diet that's low in carbohydrates and higher in fat well, and if you do decide you want to try that, then it's really important to find a, a health care practitioner that understands diet and health, and they, yeah. can, and, and they can help you through that and find the right diet for you because there are 100, over 100 diets out there, and they all work for somebody, but not yeah. everybody. And, and that's something really, really important to remember. Another thing to remember is that fasting – has been known to really to get diabetes under control yeah and uh and even get rid of diabetes yeah fasting seems to fasting and you drink water so you drink pure water and and you maybe fast for six or seven days yeah and that sounds crazy to some people but i think if you research it and go about it right it's it's very doable and i've actually heard people i was listening to a this uh nasa scientist dude on this podcast a while back and he was currently on a 23 day fast only water and he said he felt amazing yeah. so i i think when it comes to fasting and and some people consider fasting like starving yourself like you're just starving yourself i think i think we need to like step back and look at that differently because that's how a lot of people look at lack look at it that don't understand fasting and ha- haven't heard about the results people have from yeah. it well and, and i 
I think people should research a little more. Well, they do. And there are some really great uh, people to follow. Jason Fung, F-U-N-G. He is a really great one. He is very good. I think I've heard of him. Um, he's a, anyway, he knows a lot about fasting, but he's one you can find on YouTube. And, um, but anyway, no, what it does is it actually resets your systems. Yeah. And so your food, we, we live in a society where we have diseases of affluence, of having a lot of stuff. We have too much food. We have a lot of food available to us. And we and for some of us, we think we should never be hungry, that we should always, you know, because we have this food, we need to be feeling full. And that becomes an emotional eating thing as well. Um, so there's a lot of factors that can fall into this. But really you just want to be satisfied and that is not feeling full that's being satisfied and and then you can and then if you eat that way every day now i've i'm a little older i've gotten to the point i don't my body is not burning the number of calories that it did when i was raising my children i was having babies yeah you know i when i didn't eat if i had eaten only two meals a day i would have been starving to death yeah but i'm now down to two meals a day and I feel awesome. I feel better than I did when I was eating three. Three was just too many. Too yeah, much. I I'm actually that way too. I've I've always had to eat like pretty much my whole life up until recently. I've had to eat like three to four meals a day, is, and even then I'm still hungry all the time. And since I've switched over to eating a higher fat diet, and my body's adapted to burning fat as a fuel source, and I've I've been practicing fasting too on top of that. I can go like half the day without eating and I, I actually have more energy, like more like it's like more efficient ed- energy. Like mm-hmm. like once I eat, then my body has to start processing the food and that like it kind of like makes you a little tired to a degree. And mm-hmm. and my brain doesn't work as efficient until like I'm like mm-hmm. partway through that pro- part like processing of the right. food that I ate. So like I'm noticed like if I don't eat till like 11 a.m. in the morning, I, I can be more productive and more like. Just more fluent more with everything. You probably have yeah, more, more energy. Alert. Yeah. yeah, and once I eat, I notice that I'm like it takes me down a little bit. And well, that's the way I feel when I some of my energy. I eat around ten thirty or eleven in the morning, and then I eat my second meal around four. Yeah, and uh, I do the and then same. I don't eat again until eleven the next day. Yeah, and I've noticed that too when I eat my last meal around like four or five. Mm-hmm. Like if I eat again, like if I don't eat. Like I'll no, I'll notice I'll get like a a little craving for food around eight p.m. or something, but if I do, if I just like hold out and not eat like when around ten ten or eleven comes around, I like feel better. Like I just feel yeah. more. Again, well, fluid I guess is the right word. My brain's working better, mm-hmm. and I like I even sleep better because of it. I think exactly you you yeah. do. Your body is just functioning better. The parts but, are going. <laughs> yeah, functioning but better. The, it didn't really at first. It wasn't like that because at first. When, when I like was trying to practice fasting and high fat, I'd be starving because my body's used to burning carbohydrates. And so it, it like, it just feels, it's just harder for some reason. But once I got used to it, yeah, it completely changed everything. I don't get hangry ever anymore. Like I used to get yeah. hangry all the time. Like my entire life, I would get hangry every single time yeah. I would go an extra hour or two without eating, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's mind blowing how, how much it's changed like if again it goes back to like i've never i never really realized that i never that like what it was like to not eat carbohydrates all day long you know like right when i finally started cutting out the carbohydrates i realized like wow i was those things were kind of screwing me up like they made my life a lot harder they it took way more it made me hangry all the time i would have i guess huge insulin drops and stuff like that and that's what messes with you well, and that's what that's what causes cravings. So, so you yeah. so by doing this now, if you have a disease like diabetes or or heart disease, you you're going to want to be under the care of a healthcare professional um, when you start a fast, or you know, just so that you can be monitored and and you're not doing it too fast. Yeah. Um, because your body is ill. Your body is broken basically and you're you want to try and regulate that and get your health back as much as possible by using a fast um so i think it's really interesting that what you were talking about with how you (laughs) you would get 
hangry and so forth. And, and then you would have yeah. food cravings, those carb cravings. Yeah. And so a fast can also get rid of those carb cravings. And not just a fast, but just getting yeah. off of simple carbs and sugars. I found that with me. I don't crave. I don't have cravings anymore. Once in a great while, yeah. I think I want to eat something. You know, but that's more of a nervous eating. But I'm not craving sugar, and I'm not craving. Yeah, that's you know, a good point. That was a huge thing brownies. for me too. Like when they bring, when people would bring donuts to work or pizza, I used to be like, man, it was so hard to resist those. But now, nowadays, like it's it's not hard. I don't have that craving anymore. Like yeah. they sound good. Like I know they taste good, so I think about that, and it's like, man, mm. it'd be those taste good. I like to eat them, but it's not like. It's not hard to resist it anymore. It's like it's on a different level now. Like like when right. I see them, I'm like, I know this will make me feel really crappy, yeah. and and I don't have like the urge, like the extreme urge to eat one isn't there anymore. And well, it's, it's really well, interesting. Something, Samuel, you have you have a birthday on Tuesday. I do, don't so, I? <laughs> you do. And what I get about my birthday. <laughs> what I'm getting at is that you have had you have some experience now. You've learned yeah. what your body uh handles and what it doesn't handle and how you feel and you've been very intuitive with what's going on in your body, but you are almost on Tuesday thirty years old. Thirty years young. I know. Thirty years young. Woo <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I can't believe that you're you're gonna be 30 yeah <laughs> but i'm excited about that because what it's, yeah, it's just a great cool. time it's really 30 is just a wonderful time of your life yeah you know well, well it's it's interesting because like some people a lot of people like are really scared of becoming 30 and if you really look at it like you have a long way to go especially if you're eating healthy you know i look at people like you know some of the people i really look up to are people like joe rogan and stuff and he's like 50 three or 54 and he's like he's like the healthiest he's ever been in his life he yeah. says anyways and i'm like yeah man that's like that's 20 years away still like it's like that's uh -huh. almost half my life yeah du it's like double my life yeah and like i can improve myself for 20 more years yeah and then on top of that maybe 50 more yes. to be 100 and then on top of that if if things keep going the way they're going and the science the science is correct that's coming out right now we could live a lot longer than that so it's like man mm -hmm. we have have so far to go we do it's, have a long way to go it's possible i could go we like not just me but like people nowadays could live for so long it's well and i tell i'll tell you my goal we all go through stages in our lives and we are getting older we can't stop the aging process altogether but yeah. what you can do is your my goal is to be the healthiest I can be in that stage of my life. Yeah. So for instance, I'm, you know, I'm a little older than Joe Rogan. <laughs> but you guys are you guys are around the same age. Yeah, I'm a, I'm I'm a few years older, but but anyway, you get into your 50s and what does it matter? So yeah. I uh, <laughs> but I feel I probably feel better now than I felt I felt in my 30s and 40s. That's awesome. And it's powerful. You know, physically I feel better. I, I don't think I look younger, but <laughs> You look but, skinnier. Do I? Yeah. Well I look I feel good. I feel really good and but that has a lot to do with what I eat. And I, I recently went and had a foot zoning done. I think I yeah, told you about that. Yeah. I'm not sure about feel about foot zoning. Well, well let's hear let's hear your story. <laughs> well, I if I well, I don't know if I should tell you the whole story, but um the person that uh that foot zoned my feet that's where foot zoning is where um your feet are rubbed in certain yeah. spots because your feet have all the nerve endings to all the organs and parts in your body in them and i don't know if everyone anyone realizes that but you can rub certain parts of your feet and um and they might hurt one day and then maybe the next day they don't hurt yeah. And that has to do with largely with blood flow through your organs and so forth. And you you want good blood flow in yeah. your organs because if you don't get good get blood flow then you're probably that organ is probably atrophying in some way or mm -hmm. shutting down. Um so you want that. Well, so also what they can find, they can go through your digestive system through your foot. Yeah. And they have they know exactly where that's at where that's located on your foot 
and um, and they rub that. And so the lady that was foot zoning my uh, my feet, her name's Diane, and she actually um, asked me, she says, does that hurt? She was rubbing my digestive system. And I said, yeah. no, no, it feels fine. She goes, really? And I said, yes. And she goes, okay. So she kept rubbing, and then she did the other foot, and she said, does that hurt? And I said, no, it feels fine. She goes, wow. She goes, I don't think I've ever zoned anyone's feet that didn't hurt in that spot. Well, that was a mm. digestive system. Interesting. And so she said, what do you eat? And so she wanted to know everything I ate and, yeah. and all that. So I told her, you know, what I ate, and now she's eating the same way. And she said she feels amazing. So I, I feel like I've landed on a good, uh, a couple of good things that I'm doing in my diet. And um, yeah, that's awesome. So anyway, so I was glad to hear that, and I thought that was pretty amazing that yeah. uh, that I didn't hurt on those spots. But mm, uh, that's awesome to hear. So anyway, but foot zoning is uh, just a modality that's used and can't if you go to the right foot zoner you can learn a lot about your body just through through that yeah one that's a, a foot zoner that is very um knowledgeable and has a lot of experience yeah i, I haven't really heard much about foot zoning be, besides what you've told me about it so i don't know I don't i'll know have to schedule it. one with for you i'm down to try it i'm done to try it yeah i just so I did that with Spencer when he was suffering from Lyme disease so badly, when his symptoms were very acute, and um, and he would just cry. I know yeah. I don't know. I'm not a professional foot zoner, but I do know some spots on the bottoms of the feet to rub that actually help with blood flow and so forth in certain organs. And so when I would work on him, he would just literally cry. He would curl up in a fetal position. I'd say, do you want me to stop? No, keep doing it. And the reason why he wanted me to keep doing it is because he felt better afterward. Oh, uh, interesting. So I would work on his feet every day, sometimes twice a day, and it would help him to feel better. He, he was in a lot of pain at that time. That's powerful. Yeah, it is. It is pretty powerful. And that's something that, like... When Grandma was in the hospital, uh, when she she was having some problems and she had surgery, she had problems with her lungs, and and of course they don't want you touching them, you know, when they come out of surgery. But I did. I touched yeah. her feet, and I would rub her feet with oil that I had there. You can use essential oils. Some of them you have to be careful with. Can interact with medications, but yeah, but, um, I would. I would just take some olive oil and rub her feet. And she would tell me, oh, that feels so good. Mm. And so your feet are really important. You know, treat your feet well. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to strengthen my feet. I, uh, yeah. you know, I do the barefoot shoes. Oh, and yeah. I try to walk around barefoot and do running in the barefoot shoes. And sometimes I'll even hike barefoot, which can be painful. Yeah, I bet. But, yeah, I realize that your feet are important in a lot of different ways. So, yeah. I'm trying yeah. to strengthen those. Yeah, they are really important. But Yeah. Anyway, so that's that was kind of an interesting topic to side note for foot zoning. Foot zoning. But, but yeah, I think that, um, but I was saying that because, and telling you that because of the digestive, um, digestive, digestive tract. So, yeah. Yeah. A foot zoner can tell what's going on inside your body. If they're really good, they can tell. Because it, there are little crunchy things that are inside your feet, too, when you have problems. Mm, interesting. Um, which I think is, well, like your lungs. If you have congested lungs, they'll feel little crumbly things mm. in your foot mm. in that area that's connected to your lungs. Interesting. So, yeah, it's, it is very interesting. and. So anyway, but yeah, back to the digestive system a little bit more. Um, so there are foods that are better than others yeah. to eat. And we talked about getting rid of uh, gluten, sugar, and dairy. And and you don't have to get rid of them all at once, all three of them all at once. I have uh, with my uh, some of the people that I've worked with, I usually start them out. If they're, if they're really, really scared about eliminating one of those things i will start them with eliminating fructose 
Mm. And that's not... So fruit? No. Well, no. I won't have them eliminate uh, fruit in its whole state. But I will have them eliminate certain fruits. So they can eat berries, berries, and peaches. Peaches? Peaches are uh, low sugar. They are. Uh huh. And mm. um and there, but some of the high sugar ones are like grapes. Grapes are yeah. super high sugar. Apples. Uh, apples, but they have a ton of fiber and they have pectin in it. So they, so when you eat that, it slows down the uptake of sugar and glucose into the bloodstream and the fructose. So you're yeah. not. It's not spiking your blood sugar like you would if you juiced the apple and then drank the juice. Ah, I see. Okay. What about oranges? They seem high in sugar. Well, oranges with the pulp aren't bad. In fact, fresh orange juice isn't even that bad. But the concentrated stuff you buy in the store, any of the juice you buy in the store is really, really high in fructose. I see. So you want to avoid the juice aisle? You want yeah. to avoid orange juice that's in the store because all of them have been pasteurized. You can't, they can't even sell it if it hasn't been pasteurized. Yeah. And if they do, then they have a special deal going on. But it, I've, I haven't seen it since we lived in Florida. What about bananas? They Bana- seem like they're high. In- super high. Yeah. Yeah. A banana every now and then isn't a big deal, but you just don't want to eat them all the time. And, and, and the green bananas. Not dark green, but a greener banana is starch resistant. So that's like a cold potato. Yeah, a cold it's better. Cold potato is better because it is actually acts as a prebiotic, which feeds the good bacteria in your stomach. Interesting. So a probiotic is something that puts bacteria in your stomach and adds yeah. more bacteria, but a prebiotic is something that feeds the bacteria. Mm. So probiotic feeds, prebiotic aids. And antibiotic kills, right? It's yeah. What's prebiotic? Prebiotic, a prebiotic feeds. Prebiotic feeds it. Okay. A probiotic puts it in there. It's just more, more. Yeah, it just adds more to it, and yeah. then an antibiotic, okay. of course, kills and is very undiscerning. Although some are more potent than others, so I see some kill more off, more than others, and then also how often you're using an antibiotic, especially in childhood. And some yeah. of the things that determine whether you have a good gut flora or good intestinal flora is starts from when you were born. Do you know if you were born, uh, did you go through the birth canal or were you born C-section? Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, the birth canal actually, and this is kind of gross, but the baby, when it comes down the birth canal, it, it will take in the bacteria in through its mouth. It takes it up through its nose. It takes it in through its eyes. It comes in in all the oral cavities of the baby, and it is actually a good thing. Yeah. It's a very good thing. It's been happening since the beginning of time. Yeah, for (laughs) sure. And But those babies that are born through C-section, they don't get that. So there's the first blow to your gut. And then uh, if they're breastfed, so that mother's milk is incredibly important. Yeah, I hear that's one of the most powerful forms of food in the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it most nutrients, most nutrient dense. Yeah, and it also contains the bacteria to help with the uh, build the gut lining. It's that gut lining. That is, if you have enough stomach acid, you're going to have a lot of mucus coating your stomach because it is protecting the gut lining from the hydrochloric acid. You want that. And that mucus is full of bacteria. Yeah. So there's a lot of bacteria, and you want that, I mean, in a normal stomach. And uh, so, but stress depletes that, and... um, and uh, just our diets and lifestyle, mm. you know, can really cause a lot of problems with that. But that's the first place it starts. And I would say just chew your food. Yeah, I need to get better at that. Well, everybody. I inhale that. my food. Well, we're all on a racetrack. We live, in, you know, we're always moving so fast. And, yeah, and I definitely do. We don't take much. time to sit down and eat and enjoy our food and slow down. 
So, yeah, we're affected in a big way by our yeah. lifestyle. That's a lifestyle factor. Yeah, it's definitely a place I could improve on, without a doubt. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of yoga lately. I think I think a lot of the reason why I feel so good afterwards is because it is uh, balancing that out. Like, you move slow and you breathe slow through yoga. Yeah. And a lot of my life is fast, 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 fast. Get this done. Don't yeah. slack. Drive fast. Destroy my food. <laughs> Show yeah. up, be on time for everything. But that's you're just describing everybody's <coughs> life, because yeah. that's really what we're we're all doing, and and we're just our our day is measured by how much we were able to do, our yeah. productivity. Yeah, I mean, I I I do measure it off of that. Like, uh, there was a day last week, last Monday, where I like. It was it was an awesome day. I like I woke up and I went and lifted weights and then I went to work and I made eggs at work and then I went then I went to uh, hot yoga at twelve and then I went to jujitsu that night and I was like I was like man I'm killing it like I gotta figure out how to do this every single day and then I, I like worked on the new ayahuasca website for a little bit and and it was just a really productive day and and then the next day I was just I was wrecked. <laughs> I was like I was so tired, and like the next three yeah. days, yeah. like I I just felt worn out. I was like, dang, I, yeah, I overdid it. Like when I have all this energy, I overdo it. It's like I need to figure out how to have this energy, but but be able to have discipline when I do have it, and so I don't ruin myself for the next few days. You know, right, right, yeah. I it's I hard totally to balance yourself get that. Out. My my big thing is what determines whether my day is great or not and that this is sad i mean i can have a great day anyway it's just that sleep yeah. is really critical for me yeah i'm sure that's what helped feel my day last monday too is sleeping well sunday night yeah and and what i've discovered is that it's not just getting seven to nine hours of sleep it's when i get that seven to nine hours of sleep yeah so for instance if i go to bed at midnight and I get seven hours of sleep, I don't feel as rested as if I went to bed at 9.30 or quarter to 10, and yeah, I sleep the through the, the witching hours, which is between 10 and 2. Yeah. So I can sleep. If I cover that first uh, REM cycle between 10 and 2, boy, I, I feel so much better. And if I can get a second REM cycle in, then yeah i feel amazing in the morning yeah i need to i've been just going to sleep later and later lately and i need to get back to that 10 30 11 it's hard for me to go to sleep earlier than 10 30 yeah but well, when i was doing that it was it was good yeah and that's just an average so everybody's a little different but but not too different and some people yeah. say well i don't need very much sleep at night but you know what? Yeah, I think that's crap. There's nobody that doesn't need it. They just have gotten used to it. They and but if they were to get into the habit of going to sleep at the right times, sleeping for the right amounts, don't drink caffeinated drinks after two p.m. Yeah, you know, uh, try not to exercise at night if you can help it because that also can rev up your body for some people. Yeah. So there are some things. Turn. Uh, I call it the power down hour. So you, yeah. for some people, powering down an hour before you go to bed is good. Some people need two hours. But you want that melatonin to kick in. And that has to do with darkness. And yeah. The Cover light. up your windows. There's so yeah. much light pollution, especially if you live in the city. Yeah. I yeah. listened to this guy named Matthew Walker, who's a brain scientist who studies sleep. And he said... Uh, I think it was one out of a thousand people can actually get by with less than eight, eight hours of sleep and be okay. Like one out of yeah. a thousand. See, are you one? Of, are you low. the one out of a thousand? No. And I'm, I think that it might have been an even higher percentage yeah. or a lower percentage. So, and and he says those people they still need like four to six hours. One out of a th one out of a thousand can get by okay with four to six hours, and everybody else needs at least eight hours to to like not lose benefits. Yeah, I and that so, yeah that don't is so kid true. yourself. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> don't kid yourself. And 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 another thing to remember that might be a motivator is that low sleep, so 
maybe four or five hours of sleep at night each night can lead to Alzheimer's. It's connected. Yeah, he to was Alzheimer's. talking about all the negative effects, and I think he was talking about that too. Yeah, it's, it's pretty drastic. It is. It's really crazy. And so, what I would do um, is just start off with with one of those things. Start off with powering down. You know, an yeah. hour before bed. And yeah. that's that's might be tough. You live in a household that's wired all the time. Yeah. And if you if you can get at least one thing down, you take mm-hmm. one little baby step and get one yeah. part of it down, which that is actually a huge step. Yeah. Not really a baby step, but if you can get that down, it just mm-hmm. makes everything else easier. Like yeah. I notice when I when I sleep better, I make better decisions. Yeah. And it's easier it's easier to make good choices when you feel better. It's that's for you know? sure. I'm I'm right with you on that because that's the way I am. If yeah. I don't if I don't get to sleep until like one in the morning because I still have a 16 year old at home, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I I don't get to sleep till really late, and the next yeah. day I'm shot. I, I I usually don't feel that good, and I try and keep to myself. Yeah, I'm I'm the um, same. I and I don't like really sleeping during the day. I can do a little power nap type thing, but I'm not really in a deep sleep but it does yeah, it rejuvenate doesn't, it doesn't, me a little bit it helps but it's not yeah it doesn't not take the place be. and and someone and one time uh some research that i had read said that you really cannot catch up on sleep yeah it's gone yeah once I've, it's gone, I've heard it's that gone. too yeah but yeah so. um let's wrap this up it's All been right. an hour yeah yeah uh where can people contact you or, or get in touch or follow you well, you can contact me through chriskcoaching at gmail.com. I have a newsletter that I send out, and you're, if you'd like to subscribe to it, just uh, send an email, and in the subject box, just say subscribe. And, um, and then also you can contact me on Instagram, and my name there is healthcoach underscore herbco. And uh, and that's a good place to contact me. All right. Awesome. And uh, you can contact me on Instagram, too. My Instagram is Sam Kemp, CJ. Um, I'm helping to put on an ayahuasca retreat in May. If uh, that's the kind of thing you're interested in, you can always uh, message me on there. There's a link to a new website that I've my friend made for me recently for the this next ayahuasca retreat you can check out all the details there and that's it yeah and i just want to add that i always do about an hour free breakthrough sessions with anyone that is interested in it there's no obligation to you know go into a full coaching program but that's always an option but i just help people figure out what they want what they want and how to get it Awesome. With their health. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Get get in touch with me. I'd love to talk. Yeah, your health coaching sessions are powerful. But, yeah, that's it. Okay. Thanks. See ya.